Our next uh, speaker is an equally distinguished uh, scholar and uh, essayist who has written uh, remarkably and profoundly on uh, Islam. And I actually came across him uh, as uh, somebody who did publish in the New York Review of Books. It was a review essay of a number of uh, reformist uh, Islamic uh, scholars. And it was, I, I like it for its cool and disengaged uh, um, uh, position. And uh, there's one li a line that um, stuck in my mind. You kind of give the review of these liberal positions and you say, yeah, surely, yeah, there are these liberals uh, um, taking the Islamic flag uh, out there. Actually, many of them teach uh, at North American uh, uh, universities and law schools from UCLA to Toronto to Emory University. But how much traction do these ideas actually have at the grassroots? Well, you escaped censorship, but saying such things, um, um, facing the what I call scholarly Islam industry is provocative and not the obvious line to take because the usual right post is you cannot say anything about Islam. There are too many Islams. If you try to name the thing following very naively a line like Ernest Gellner that there may be some doctrinary element of it that is peculiarly secularization resistant that was his famous by now infamous line you know you get policed for these things and I appreciated the very candid and open mannered way in which you approached the issue but now it's for Malisa to take the microphone well thank you for those very kind words and uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, it has been an incredible privilege to be able to reach um, uh, readers such as yourself uh, through the New York uh, Review of Books. Um, I wanted to say something about some of the things which we have already been talking about, particularly uh, the issue of uh, Islam in, in Britain, which is what I was invited to talk about. And I think there are several statements have already come up which suggest that what we are talking about is something very complex and uh, difficult to uh, pin down. There's also, I think, an issue which um, comes up in these discussions about um, uh, nationalism and immigration, which is sometimes overlooked. Do we really think of nations now as communities, or are they rather templates of social custom. I'm struck because I live in multicultural London, which is certainly a place where uh, you have people from different ethnic, religious backgrounds. But we are all subject to the same set of rules, particularly, for instance, when you go out into the public sphere, into the street. Everybody has to obey certain conventions of of, 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 of traffic discipline. And there is a sense in which, because I also spend part of my time in France, you know very quickly if you step on a zebra or a pedestrian crossing in Paris, uh, you put your life in danger. In London, you can count on the uh, proper observance of pedestrian priorities, whoever's at the wheel. And these are uh, quite, actually quite important uh, distinctions. The nation is a kind of template of uh, customary observance as much as it is perhaps a community in the uh, traditional sense. The position of Islam in Britain has obviously been evolving and changing very rapidly over the last uh, few decades. Um, there are roughly now between 1.6 and 2 uh, million Muslims in Britain. They come from a variety of backgrounds. Um, the first uh, Muslim settlers were uh, Lascars or donkeymen and uh, stokers uh, who greased the uh, ships of the merchant navy. Uh, they're known as donkeymen because they greased the, the engines and many of them were um, the donkey engines, as they were, were then called. Many of them actually came from Yemen, which of course was a South Yemen, which is a British uh, tr protectorate. After the First World War, uh, many of them settled in 
uh, the Tiger Bay area of Cardiff and uh, in South Shields around Tyneside. And we had anti-immigrant feeling. I mean, some reference was made to union um, hostility to immigration in North America. Uh, as early as 1919, uh, there were demonstrations by British merchant sailors who were demanding the repatriation of these uh, immigrants who were seen as a threat. Uh, some married into local um, families. Uh, but interestingly enough, the signal campaign which really defined the new position of Islam in Britain, the Salman Rushdie affair in the late 1980s, um, most of them stood aloof from that campaign. Um, perhaps because of the, the fact that they already belong to a second and third generation, that the issue of um, raised by the Rushdie affair uh, didn't affect them to the same degree. The 1960s saw a considerable volume of immigration um, in the wake of decolonization. And uh, some scholars have observed, I think correctly, that it took a particular form, sometimes described as encapsulation or chain migration. People were building on existing family connections. Uh, and you actually had small groups of people from particular areas in South Asia um, uh, settling in different parts of, um, uh, of Britain. So you had something that could almost be described as the transplantation of, of village cultures. You had Pakistanis coming from Mirpur in Kashmir, Bengalis from the Silhet area of Bangladesh, Gujaratis from India and East Africa. Uh, a wide variety of religious traditions um, from the subcontinent, Barelvis, Diobandis, the Ahlit Hadith, the Tablighi Jamaat, uh, the latter is a supposedly apolitical evangelical group which aims uh, to convert um, Muslims to more correct observance of Islam. So not targeting outsiders, but really uh, designed rather like you find Christian evangelical groups uh, preaching uh, to the already converted. Um, you also had groups of East African um, migrants, particularly after the Amin uh, expulsions in Uganda in, in 1972, um, where more liberal groups uh, arrived, the, or less conservative groups, the Ismailis, uh, the Memons, uh, the Koja Ishnashiris. All of these groups have added to considerable uh, diversity of Islam uh, in, in the United Kingdom. Um, you have, of course, famously uh, a right-wing uh, resistance to migration articulated by the former defense minister, Enoch Powell, uh, in 1968, who was actually sacked uh, for uh, a statement where he quoted a Roman historian talking about the river Tiber flowing with much blood. Uh, he was sacked by uh, the conservative leader, uh, the then Prime Minister Edward Heath, but uh, he received huge numbers of letters in, uh, in support. And at that juncture, one can say that um, immigration, particularly from South Asia, became really an issue on the uh, British political landscape. The other sort of landmark in the uh, evolution of what we might call Islamic consciousness in the UK uh, occurred around the publication of the Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie in, uh, uh, in 1978. And of course, it was sealed in a sense by the fatwa, the, the uh, religious edict uh, calling for his uh, execution by the Ayatollah Khomeini. I don't want to get into too much detail on that, but quite clearly Khomeini had his own particular reasons for articulating this statement. Uh, there had been deaths in uh, South Asia uh, over riots, uh, protesting uh, about the book, although the Indian reader Rajiv Gandhi had um, uh, actually banned the book. Uh, but basically, what I think matters uh, in terms of the evolution of Islam in Britain was that this became a kind of a polarizing event. Uh, Muslims 
um, particularly those Muslims who opinion polls were uh, saying were uh, in support of the fatwa, um, were increasingly designated as enemies of free speech. There were mass demonstrations in London, in Hyde Park, uh, some of which I attended uh, as an observer, uh, calling for Rushdie's uh, execution. And interestingly enough, um, that uh, the momentum of that campaign really produced a, a certain new kind of institutionalization of Islam in Britain. Uh, the Islamic Action Committee, which um, was formed around that um, uh, movement uh, by uh, an East African uh, immigrant, uh, Iqbal Sakrani, um, uh, became the core of the what eventually became an umbrella organization, uh, the Muslim uh, Council uh, of Britain, um, which was eventually established uh, in 1997 as a group which uh, was supposed to represent the uh, diversity of uh, Islamic um, traditions uh, in Britain. It's uh, its model was to some extent adapted from uh, the Bradford Council of Mosques. Bradford was one of the centers of the Rushdie uh, agitation uh, in 1988, uh, and very near Bradford up in the north, you also had the a group of Muslims in, in Dewsbury who actually took the initiative in publicly burning uh, Salman Rushdie's novel and uh, actually summoning the media to film it so that uh, they were able to uh, draw attention to this event. Rather interestingly, there was always a small entrepreneurial element in this whole thing because originally uh, the local TV stations didn't express very much interest in the agitation uh, until it had built up a certain momentum, by which time the guys who'd actually made a video of it uh, were in a very strong position to uh, make a few bucks by selling the images of the burning book uh, to the various TV uh, stations. So there's almost a little hint of entrepreneurialism uh, in that particular agitation. Um, the Muslim Council of Britain, which was modeled on the Bradford uh, Council, uh, it, the idea was that the different diverse traditions of um, of, of the UK could be uh, sort of become interlocutors for the government um, and, and that they would represent uh, various different organizations. Um, the original Bradford Council of Mosques established in 1980 uh, was the model for the future Muslim Council of Britain. It represented 26 different mosques in Bradford City Half of them were under the control of the very conservative Dia Bandi group, whose theology is, underpins that of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, ten were from the much more mystical Sufi-oriented uh, Barelvis. One was from a, a revival movement called the Ahli Hadith, and there was also a, an Ithnashiri Shia mosque, and one for the uh, Ismaili Boras. So you had a kind of diversity of communities, and this was the model, the template, which the um, Muslim Council of Britain uh, tried to, um, uh, to, to emulate. The, uh, under the Blair government, this um, body uh, received a considerable amount of, uh, of patronage, especially during the uh, period um, uh, after 9-11, when it was felt very important that there should be interlocutors between uh, Muslim Britain and, and, and the government, and uh, the, um, the war in Iraq. But uh, when it became very clear that the um, leaders of the Muslim Council of Britain uh, were not particularly happy about uh, government policy, uh, a certain distancing uh, uh, began to take place. Um, BBC did an investigation into the leadership of the Muslim Council of Britain uh, in uh, 2005, after the atrocities in the London Underground, when 52 people were killed by suicide bombers. 
Um, at that point, uh, the BBC Panorama program uh, investigated a question of leadership. Uh, it, it concluded with some justification that uh, many of the leaders of the MCB were very influenced by the separatist, Maududist uh, ideology come fr coming from Pakistan. Uh, and uh, there were other uh, headline issues, for instance, the refusal of the Muslim Council to send um, official representatives to uh, attend Holocaust Memorial Day celebrations. Uh, in 2009, the Deputy General Secretary, uh, Dr. Abdallah, was castigated for expressing support for Hamas actions against uh, the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, so the government funding was cut, and Ruth Kelly, the then community secretary, um, diverted funds to local uh, councils. Uh, Yahya Burt, a prominent Muslim intellectual convert, who was actually the son of a former director general of the BBC, uh, Lord Burt, uh, points out that having groomed and promoted a unified Muslim lobby for nearly a decade, the British government depicted it as part of the problem when it proved insufficiently uh, compliant. Um, tensions, obviously, with, and we've had some reference to this earlier, with uh, Muslims, uh, the Muslim community as a whole, uh, were greatly exacerbated following the Anglo-American invasion of Iraq in 2003. But I would suggest that it also paradoxically um, marked a stage in wider integration. I myself attended um, the 2003 demonstration, which brought three uh, or two million people into the streets of London uh, against the, uh, the war. Uh, the Stop the War Coalition um, included Muslim activists marching alongside gays and lesbians. Uh, well, traditionally, Islam has been projected as being uh, very homophobic, and Islamic statements have sometimes authenticated that position. But uh, when you actually have people marching, uh, you had, uh, I find myself actually hedged between the Hizbut Tahrir uh, and a sort of extremist Muslim faction and uh, the North London uh, gay and lesbian uh, group under their pink flag, there was a certain sense that there are solidarities that transcend the um, peculiar obsession that many religious communities seem to have about uh, private sexual behavior. Um, the, uh, another kind of important milestone um, in, in the media uh, treatment of Islam in the UK was the uh, rights critique of the mayor of London, the then mayor of London, Ken Livingstone's invitation to Sheikh uh, Karadawi, the well-known uh, Islamic preacher based in, in Qatar, um, who uh, has made qualified um, approvals of Palestinian suicide bombings in certain, uh, in certain uh, circumstances. And generally speaking, I think there has been a a move away from the kind of positive multiculturalism which um, Livingston himself embraced. Um, a couple of years ago, Trevor Phillips, uh, Afro-Caribbean chair of the Commission of Racial Equality, um, uh, took the view that Livingston's assertive policy of multiculturalism was encouraging separatism and ghettoization of immigrant communities uh, in, in Britain. And he emphasized uh, the need to establish what he called a culture of core Britishness. I personally, as an Anglo-Irishman, have a bit of a problem with the idea of Britishness. It's a problematic term which overrides or transcends the tighter concepts of Englishness, Irishness, Scottishness, or Welshness. But an argument can be made that Britishness, in contrast to, say, Frenchness or Germanness, <laughs> can include people of non-British ethnicities precisely because it is multinational by definition. Uh, Britain is one of the few multinational countries in Europe. Maybe the equivalent of Britishness in this context would be, uh, uh, following the arrival of an independent Scotland, would be the idea of Scandinavian or Nordic. 
Philip's critique harmonized with Tory reactions, conservative reactions to multiculturalism. In 2008, the Conservative Party conference, Dominic Grieve, the then Home Affairs spokesman, uh, described multiculturalism, which he never really defined, frustratingly, as undermining uh, uh, British uh, values. I think um, kind chairman is telling me my time is, is nearly up, but um, I would just like to uh, conclude by a brief theological reflection, because I think this is actually very significant. Um, Muslims are often defined as other in the media, as, as unassimilable and so forth, and this produces a reciprocal, uh, a reciprocal response uh, among certain activists. The reification of religiosity is a characteristic of modern religions in response to the uh, forces of secularization. Tim Winter, who is a, a Muslim chaplain at Cambridge, has elaborated eloquently on the transposition of the vocabulary of faith into the vocabulary of identity. Uh, he points out that Muslim, uh, Islam and Muslim have replaced the word iman, which means faith, a word used 20 times more frequently in the Quran than Islam and Muslim. Um, this tends to be reinforced by the practice of what you might call orthopraxis. Bassem Tibi, who is a big critic of the Muslim Brotherhood, has explained uh, the problematic Islamic heritage poses for modern societies by showing how historically religious scholars privileged the culture of fiqh, which is jurisprudence, manifested in rulings about social behavior, such as the correct conduct of women, over the more philosophical and adaptable fields of theology and ethics. Hence, modern Islamists zealously seek to enforce aspects of social conformity extrapolated from the corpus of fiqh rather than uh, redefine the ethical principles contained in the Quran and Muhammad's teaching. This has obvious ram ramifications in, the, for instance, the issues surrounding the uh, appearance of, of Muslim women in Britain, where there are social pressures to wear the hijab, the, the headscarf, uh, and the more extreme groups like Hizb al-Tahrir will insist on something called the, the jilbab. And in fact, they uh, helped to bring a case which was eventually reached the House of Lords of a young woman who was excluded from school because uh, she wasn't allowed to wear the full uh, body robe uh, in, in the school uh, she was attending. But uh, contrary to that, and I think this picks up on some of the points that were made by Thomas Erickson earlier, uh, what you now are getting in the UK is a very vigorous uh, Muslim fashion industry where young entrepreneurs are setting up design studios specifically for the British market. And that seems to me to perhaps um, confirm what was said earlier um, about the way in which uh, market forces in a kind of a way can actually uh, help to uh, add to integration. The other point, which I haven't really time to elaborate on, but if anyone wants to bring it up in discussion, I'd be very happy to, is the way in which Britain's foremost temple of culture earlier this year, the British Museum, hosted uh, highly controversially uh, a, an exhibition of the Hajj, uh, the pilgrimage to Mecca, where they actually replicated the whole kind of pilgrimage process at the center of, um, of the British Museum, uh, where Karl Marx wrote Das Kapital, in the same very space where he wrote Das Kapital. And what was quite interesting about that is they got twice the number of expected uh, visitors. They got something like 140,000 in the three-month period, 64% of them from British minorities, and 17% um, of them, um, much higher than other expeditions, were people under uh, the age of 17. So there is a sense in which the British establishment, in its inimical way, has try to use its social force, its social dynamic, in order to sense, to, to enable Muslims to feel uh, uh, included. And it's a rather interesting uh, sort of footnote on that, is that uh, the ancient orders of chivalry, which most of us regard as long redundant, have been used to that effect. 
um, in the aftermath of the Rushdie scandal, the Queen uh, conferred knighthoods on both uh, uh, Sir Iqbal Sikrani, the main anti um, Rushdie agitator, and the great novelist himself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our last speaker is uh, Jude Clausen, who is a professor of politics at uh, Brandeis University. She is the author of two widely noticed uh, uh, books on Islam in Europe. The first, The Islamic uh, Challenge, which I myself wrote, uh, not wrote, I would have liked to write it, uh, read very carefully. Um, and uh, what she gets across is the picture that to me was the astonishing uh, message there of a very moderate uh, um, compromise-minded uh, organizational leadership um, of, um, of Islam uh, and Muslims across European countries. And we met one time only before, I think it was in Montebello in Canada, and I asked you, so which country do you cover? Well, basically all European countries, you said. So that is uh, uh, 10 countries or something, quite uh, from an empirical point of view, uh, 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 yeah, an astonishing uh, accomplishment. And um, however, there is one exception to the overall moderate picture of Islamic leaders in Europe, which you which you point to uh, uh, there in that book, and that is Britain. And and Britain, you say these these guys, they are rather more conservative and uh, militantly. Uh, um, religious, to th say the least, than, uh, than their peers in other European countries. And that, of course, raises certain questions. So what is uh, the cause of it? Uh, if you read Robert Lycan's recent book, Europe's Angry Muslims, you get a sense it is simply that whole village communities from Mirpur were wholesale imported into certain suburbs uh, of uh, big uh, uh, English uh, cities. So uh, uh, other suspicions are, of course, that is what I was more more interested in when I read that, that British multiculturalism, this uh, um, homegrown uh, British uh, uh, way of uh, liberalism, now called multicultural, that good fences make good neighbors, uh, may be a good uh, um, feeding or bad feeding ground for that kind of extremism. I don't have an answer to that here, but Jit Clausen surely has written uh, very uh, in an illuminating and provocative uh, way about these issues, and I'm looking forward to her presentation. Well, thank you for that kind um, introduction. It's always nice to meet people who have read your book. Sometimes you sit and write, and you write, and you think, oh my God, is anybody ever going to read this? <laughs> um, I, uh, I will... Um, talk about that book a little bit today uh, because I'll focus on on Muslims and, and Muslims uh, political activities and um, I was provoked in the late 1990s uh, not just by Samuel Huntington's uh, discussions about Muslims about as the indigestible indigestible minority and secularization resistant, uh, but also by uh, a change in, a in attitudes um, towards immigrants and Muslims in particular in my home country, Denmark. Um, I watched uh, Danes uh, changing the way they talked about other people. And um, I was, it set off um, a, a number of thoughts in my head. Uh, I am myself an immigrant. I live in the United States. It took me about 10 years to decide that, yes, maybe I should get citizenship um, and all that. It certainly took me a long time to walk up to a platform and actually present myself as an immigrant. But uh, here I am. I'm an American. Hi. <laughs> uh, the, um, so I thought that uh, you know there's a process of change when you move, and it, but it takes time. And uh, it didn't make sense to me that the things that were being said about uh, European Muslims really um, uh, would hold, because in one way or another, European Muslims have all chosen to come to Europe, uh, either as political refugees, economic refugees, uh, just as simple migrants, or to settle with families. One way or another, uh, there is, uh, the process of migration involves choice, a very modern phenomenon, choice. And um, 
so I uh, decided that I wanted to ask uh, people who were uh, had joined the mainstream uh, political uh, frameworks in the West and ask them what they actually thought uh, Muslims really wanted uh, when it came to politics. So the first thing I needed to do was to pick up the phone and call various members of parliaments uh, and ask who are based on reading or biographies. I thought maybe they were Muslim, but I had to confirm. So I said, are you Muslim? Would you like to talk to me? <laughs> and, and, and that then became the start of this book, which was really a joy to write. Uh, so it, even if you didn't read it, it's OK. It was, very, it was a lot of fun to write this book. Uh, so in the end, I interviewed 300 Muslim leaders and asked about their views about what the problems were facing uh, Muslims. Was it uh, accommodation of Islam? Could it was Islam compatible with liberal values, or was this just you know socioeconomic problems? And it actually turned out that people's views were it was 50-50. Many people said, yeah, actually it's really socioeconomic. That's really where the main issues are. But there are also these problems about religion. There are these problems. We would like to see our sons and daughters learn something about the faith. And uh, the, there's really a problem with who, the, the, I can't take my son to the local mullah. It's just, it's just terrible what he says. I can't do it. Um, and uh, I also had teenage children at that time. So of course, there was a lot to discuss there uh, about that. But the bottom line is that uh, it was stunning in the extent to which uh, the leaders I spoke with uh, said exactly the same things about what Muslims had to do as all the people were saying who were extremely critical of Muslims. Muslims must, must learn the language, they must get a job, they must get out of the house, must stop complaining. Uh, Muslims must get engaged. Uh, they have to stop burying their cousins from home. Uh, and uh, make sure that their kids go to school. Uh, Muslims must, uh, I, I know people said, no, we should not have any more migration because right now we have to deal with, what, with who we have here. And uh, all of, through the interviews, uh, it was clear that there was an extraordinary uh, support uh, and active um, appreciation of the sort of political values that we have here, free speech, um, the, the choice, uh, the right to decide who you are and who you want to be. And uh, sometimes I would just say to people, so what about all of the things that people are saying? There's a lot of complaining about discrimination, and there's uh, terrible things are being said in the press about Muslims sometimes. They said, yeah, yeah, as bad as it gets here, it's much worse where I came from. Um, so uh, it was very clear to me quickly that Muslims are about all immigrants and that a lot of what was going on in the discussion, and I think that um, uh, uh, one of our previous Paul said it, that uh, conflict started exactly at the moment when Muslims decided that they were here to stay. Uh, once there was enough money uh, in communities to go out and wanting to build real mosques, rather than meeting in you know, storefronts, uh, rented car dealerships, old green groceries, et cetera, where many people have set up uh, the mosque, but people wanted you know, real mosque run by mosque communities who were properly elected and all that, uh, with an educated um, imam, then trouble started. Uh, then you got the back, not in, my backyard movements. Uh, no, you can't do that. Mosques don't belong in the European landscape. All of that. Um, and that then became the start of conflict. Uh, I think I can give you a story about good news. There's really a lot of good news. Um, Muslim girls are getting educations. <laughs> Muslim boys are getting educated too, but not as much as the Muslim girls. Bangladeshi girls in London have shown the most uh, increase in educational scores of any group. Uh, young Turkish women are becoming professionals. Uh, there is a problem there because they're not going to marry some of these guys who are dropping out of schools. So, um, but um, 
all of that progress that has happened in the last 10 years is very often unnoticed. Uh, when I started my work in uh, over 10 years ago, there were about 22 Muslim parliamentarians in European parliaments. Today, by the latest count, and it's getting harder to count because there are more, uh, I counted 25 men and 25 women, a Muslim uh, background and faith, elected to European Parliament. So mind you, Muslims not only have been the first to get gender parity in elected office, uh, Muslims have also um, uh, gotten themselves into the political system um, to a degree that Muslims are overrepresented in comparison to uh, the uh, underlying population, particularly when you consider that in many countries, uh, you know, maybe only a, perhaps 50% of Muslims can vote. Um, this is changing very far, fast because the other news is that Muslims are actually already the old immigrants. Uh, new migration uh, comes from elsewhere. Uh, between 40 and 50% of Muslims in Europe today are um, born here. This doesn't apply in Norway because uh, Norwegian uh, migration, uh, Muslim migration is primarily from political refugees and really is a uh, little more than 10 years old. So in that regard, uh, the picture here is uh, re really one that's quite different from what we see uh, demographically speaking in say Holland where there are 850,000 Muslims. Um, in all of Scandinavia, uh, there is something like uh, maybe 600,000. Uh, so uh, uh, I think, in fact, those, those, the underlying population background for integration and for, for, for sort of make, creating a political pr uh, presence is very different here from what it is in some other countries. Um, but uh, the other news is that we now have, when I, this book came out, a lot of people saying, yeah, 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 but you're talking to, you're talking, those people you're talking to, they're only nominal Muslims, you know? They're not the real Muslims. They're not, they're not the ones you really, now that is actually not true. Uh, it was uh, four out of five of the people I interviewed uh, for the study said that uh, Islam was either important to them or very important. Very few said that it was of no importance. Um, and partly that's the reason because if you're a religious minority, to say that you're your faith, even if you're not daily practicing, to say that your faith is not important for you is in a way to deny your origin. And that becomes extremely difficult uh, if you are a religious minority because you sort of deny your own people by doing that. Uh, so even as many Muslims in the West are struggling with the meaning of what it is to be a Muslim and redefining it. Uh, which is um, causing a great deal of concern in Muslim-majority countries uh, because Muslim-majority countries are not always keen on the ways people here decide that they want to practice the faith, uh, such as having you know, women uh, being uh, prayer leaders or having uh, uh, women on the mosque community, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the boards that run the mosque, etc. All of those sort of things uh, do not always go down well. But it's also uh, the theological freedom. When you see a young Muslim woman going to Quran school, uh, having learned Arabic uh, to do so, she is bugging tradition and she is exercising her right to choose for herself. And that's what, they was, what people would say. They'd say, I think I should find out for myself what it actually says. And that is a revolutionary, revolutionary movement. We don't know where it's going to go, what it's going to mean. But sometimes it's hard to negotiate these things. And uh, the other, uh, my next book actually was about the Danish cartoons, of all things. I thought this was a topic I had to write about. I was supposed to write something else, but when my old uh, newspaper, Jyllandsposten, which was my family's newspaper, uh, put out uh, those 11 cartoons of uh, Muhammad under a headline that said the face of Muhammad and all hell broke loose. I knew I had to write about this. Um, so I did. And um, much of the good news that I have just described to you from my uh, previous research actually completely apply 
uh, to the cartoon book. No, I know I'm talking completely against what you expected. But if you go to Denmark, you will find that many Danes today will say that after the cartoon book, we really learned a lot of things. Uh, first of all, you will find many more Muslims in the media speaking not about Islam, but about the econom economic situation, or even about agriculture. Uh, you will find um, a deep sense that the radicals do not speak for Muslims, because in the protest movement that came in Denmark afterwards, there was a coalition of uh, four mo mosques run by uh, radical sheikhs. Um, uh, they had some demonstrations going to the city hall, making big prayer meetings in city hall and praying and demanding that Danes should absolutely never ever make pictures of the prophet again. Uh, the number of Muslims who joined the other side, speaking for free speech and saying what we really are unhappy about is what some of those cartoons said about who, what Muslims think and who Muslims are. Because you seem to, you, the cartoons were implying that uh, Muslims are violent and all Muslims are violent because it's a violent faith. Now, it was lost in all of this debate uh, and uh, continue to be lost, that actually half of those cartoons uh, rather depicted Muslims as the vi victims in the Danish debate. Uh, half of them made fun of the newspaper, actually. Uh, but those are not the cartoons that have uh, been flying around on the internet. So when, uh, when things then went really haywire in 2006, it wasn't because of what Danish Muslims did. It was because of what the Egyptian government did. Uh, that story I'll spare you now because it's in my book. So the, the book is called The Cartoons That Shook the World. So go and read it. Uh, it's um, in the Egyptian government uh, in a typical um, strategic masterstroke uh, of the kind that uh, Mubarak uh, was well known for, decided that they wanted to make a complaint to the United Nations about the Danes because they were very keen to show um, that Europeans discriminate too. At that time, the particular focus for this complaint was actually the United States. So I suffered from cognitive dissonance when I went to Cairo and started interviewing the Secretary General of the, the Arab League, Amr Musa, who was a failed presidential candidate, and went to the foreign ministry in Cairo and asked him what, they, what, what was it they wanted to do. And the answer every time was, oh, who cares about the Danes? But the Americans have to understand. And the point was that this was really a complaint against the West because the Egyptians didn't want to sign a charter that the Americans were pushing on them about freedom of speech in Egypt. Uh, but everybody lost control of it. And then this is where I'm now moving towards my conclusion of this talk. The problem is that all of the good news is lost because we pay, we, we held hostage by the French. We pay too much attention to the fringe. The fringe took control of the situation. Today, I can't even, I, my, my publisher, uh, Yale University Press, in the very last minute, decided <coughs> to exclude the cartoons and other illustrations uh, from my book, um, thereby setting the precedence that these cartoons are too dangerous even for the mainstream media to look at anymore or even an academic institution. And they developed a memorandum to that effect that World War III was going to break out if they were going to reprint them. Now, there was at that point no threats at all. Not against me, not against the university, not against the press. But subsequently, uh, this uh, issue about the cartoon to become a script for how we act out uh, the conflict between Muslims and the West. Uh, as late as uh, just two weeks ago, there was a demonstration in Bonn that was very carefully planned by what in German language is called Salafist, but this is what I call a jihadist group. It's a very well organized network around a preacher named Pierre Vogel. And uh, they have been handing out Korans on the streets in various cities in Copenhagen, deliberately aiming to 
uh, provoked Germans to say, no, you can't actually ha hand out Korans, which then the German government obliged them and said, no, you can't hand out Korans. After which they said, so what about all those Bibles that are being handed out, right? Can't you? And of course, there was a trap, and the government fell into the trap. Uh, but what happened next is really the worst part of it, because what happened next was that uh, what is called a counter-jihadist movement, uh, known as Pro North Rhine Westphalia, turned out in Bonn at a demonstration with placards carrying the cartoons. And the, uh, the jihadists turned up at the demonstration in Bonn carrying knives. And it was all planned. It was all planned over the internet. And uh, 29 policemen ended up getting stabbed by the jihadists. And uh, afterwards, the police have now um, prohibited uh, any public display of the Danish cartoons. Um, I don't know if it's a citywide ban, but I believe. Uh, so there you go. Uh, these drawings have uh, become dangerous. Um, and of course, it's not the drawings themselves that are dangerous, but they are dangerous because of the political dynamics that we all have to deal with. And those political dynamics are very much being driven by the fringes, by the extremes, as you in Norway saw last year. Uh, it is, I think, a, uh, a serious threat to capacity for governance. And um, it, it is incumbent upon us, uh, when we discuss multiculturalism, uh, to remember all the good news, uh, all that the benefits that we have had from Im immigration that open societies have migration and mobility and freedom of choice. And let us preserve that. Let's do something to keep it that way.